Is a little bit stretched. Okay. It's just down this angle, I think. Aha, uh -huh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Hello, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks to the organizer first to inviting me for giving this keynote speech. Thanks because I'm uh, able to come here and uh, share my thoughts with you. And also thanks to enforce me to think a little bit uh, about the field I was uh, working on before and uh, reflect a little bit upon this field. Uh, I will be <clears throat> talking about uh, illustrative visualization, which is a scientific subfield of scientific vis visualization and uh, uh, where I was working for quite uh, some years uh, until now. And uh, I will reflect, uh, be a little bit critical sometimes, but uh, I will show you how this field developed over the recent years. <clears throat> the title is the biggest nightmare for me because uh, I still am not sure whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, but uh, it is about uh, passing through the throw of disillusionment of illustrative visualization. Uh, what I mean by that, <clears throat> there is this uh, nice uh, something called hype cycle, which expresses how so certain technology developed over time. Once the technology comes, it uh, gets, because of certain technological trigger, it gets uh, high expectations, the visibility is raising, but uh, then when people start to th take this uh, technology seriously, they realize that they cannot use it for that many things as they thought they could. And after that, the visibility not the work, perhaps, but the visibility of the technology is uh, going down to the throne of disillusionment. And while some people are still working in the field and advancing it in a, in a more reasonable way, uh, they, uh, through the slope of, of enlightenment, eventually this technology ends up in something which is called plateau of productivity. Um, we can uh, see some analogies what happened with, for example, 3D technology as such. People thought they could use 3D for everything. Uh, there was a strong uh, disappointment when uh, we in vis medical visualization realized that the radiology is actually like 2D for many purposes. So that's, uh, the, the curve is somehow followed by 3D. Photorealism is another maybe uh, technology which uh, has gone this, uh, this path. And uh, perhaps also virtual reality. That was a really extreme hype which uh, then uh, was uh, uh, facing some throat of disillusionment as well. Well, on this hype cycle, it's interesting that it's called ha Gartner's hype cycle, and it was not developed by a person called Gartner, it was developed by someone else, and it's also interesting <coughs> that it is not a cycle. So uh, uh, why the term hype cycle, I don't know, but uh, uh, let's, uh, let's use this, uh, this curve now as a skeleton for the rest of my talk to, to share my thoughts about illustrative visualization. <coughs> Before talking about illustrative visualization, let me just shortly express what I mean by that. So we have illustration on one hand side, and then we have some computer generated uh, rendering on the, uh, on the left hand side. Well, for you, it's the different. And what we are trying to, or uh, it's on different levels, but maybe on the first level, we are trying to mimic the illustrator's techniques uh, to uh, our, to, to match our rendering with the, with the renderings they have uh, come up with as in the handcrafted uh, way. So it's a, it's a way how we can uh, uh, provide interactive illustrations, expressive illustrations of complex data through abstractions originating from the illustration, handcrafted illustration. And <clears throat> to talk about uh, illustrative visualization, it's quite useful to see it in two levels. One level are low-level visual abstractions, which uh, uh, is a rendering style, like stippling, hatching, and so on, which essentially can be applied to any type of, uh, of, uh, of objects, and you can render these objects with this style. And they are addressing more perceptual aspects, how we are then perceiving this, this object, as opposed to something what uh, we call high-level visual abstractions, which go more into the content, the actual content, which data is being shown, how can I modify it in order to, to enrich the visualization, provide more information in the final rendering. <clears throat> uh, these low-level abstractions, uh, if you want, you can also use the term non-photorealistic rendering, for example, 
but that's maybe a little bit less uh, instructive in order to see uh, how they are addressing, <coughs> which, which parts of our brain processing these techniques are addressing. So the high level visual abstractions are more addressing the cognitive processing in our brain, the higher uh, processing. <clears throat> when I started to think of what could be the topic of uh, the talk uh, here uh, in Warwick, I started to, by in parallel, read a book which just came out, which is called Visual Perception from a Computer Graphics Perspective. And uh, I read this book uh, uh, all from the beginning to the end. And I realized that the most interesting bit which I read was at the first page. And therefore, I'm, I'm bringing this, although this is a lot of uh, uh, text on the slide, I'm bringing this entire text here to you. So the perception scientist who wrote this book claimed that in order to have effective visualizations, in their opinion, one approach is to, to improve the perceptual effectiveness of computer graphics is to adopt tools and techniques for conveying visual information used by artists and illustrators. The other approaches, which they obviously were then uh, more uh, discussing in the book, is to build directly on the knowledge of human vision system uh, by using perceptual effectiveness as an optimization criterion in the design of computer graphic systems. And what they, the last sentence, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, relating these two, is uh, these two approaches are not completely distinct. And this is what we in illustrative visualization once look at the perceptual side, how effective, is it effective what we, uh, the rendering technique which we develop, how does it match the, the technique developed by illustrators? We can represent it in a pictogram as well. This is our computer scientist, computer graphics researcher. She's developing some OpenGL code and she's observing what an illustrator is doing and she's observing what a vision scientist is doing. And I would call the, what, at the first stage of the illustrative visualization research, people started to, to look what the visual art has provided which visual metaphors have been uh, developed and tried to mimic them. So the first stage of uh, the illustrative uh, visualization development was more or less mimicking what has been observed in the traditional media. <clears throat> the maybe start of illustrative visualization can be dated to 1990 uh, to the work of Saito and Takahashi where they, by analyzing the depth depth map and the normal map, they came up with uh, an abstraction, a uh, line drawing, mimicking abstraction of uh, polygonal scene, as we can see here. Oops. And here we can see how we can, then this is an, a slide from uh, 99 from a, a SIGGRAPH course on non-photorealistic rendering, how we can from a depth map and a normal map come to, and the discontinuities in these two maps, how can we come to certain lines which then put together will make us some line drawing uh, style. This was uh, development from 1990 up to uh, 1999. During these 10 years, I would say the visibility was uh, gained mostly. There were two books written basically covering the material of these uh, 10 years. And uh, people had a lot of expectations on this new technology. At this point, people started to take it a little bit more seriously, try to apply it for some actual uh, application areas, like, for example, in scientific visualization for visualization of volumetric data. And they came up with some object uh, space uh, uh, line drawing style where the viewing uh, angle or the viewing vector is uh, is uh, uh, is taken into account in order to find the contour generator, which is then uh, those places on the surface where the normal is perpendicular to the viewing direction. You all know this, so I'm just repeating it um, to uh, for completeness. But soon people realized. Okay, this, uh, we have to have some interval in order to, have, uh, uh, to accept certain normals in volumes. Uh, what is this interval? They realized that this interval of acceptance uh, a contour generator causes us some thick contours at some places, some thin contours at some other places, 
which is which can be seen and sold as a in a positive way that this is kind of an artistic it gives it an artistic touch that's all uh, good and nice but if you want to have a full control over your technique uh, then uh, this kind of stylistic freedom of an algorithm is no longer appreciated so people realize that uh, as we can see on our good friend from Stanford that uh, some contours get thicker and on this cone geometry we can see how this contour how this contour is getting thickened it uh, corresponds to a view dependent curvature at the place where the contour is generated so the less curve and, uh, and uh, shape is the thicker the curvature will be so we have to take the curvature into account in order to control the thickness as has been done by Gordon Kindleman in 2003. So people started to realize that, that this technique, this te these techniques which have been developed need some uh, refinement in order to make them more useful. Another <clears throat> application or some line drawing abstraction which has been developed was when people listened to the perceptual scientist which said that the region valley lines are very descriptive for certain shapes and they tried to uh, represent uh, some uh, geometry by these region valley lines which are depicted here. Um, this is a work from Otake and his colleagues in 2004 and I was wondering that he was representing a, a valley by a light, white line and a ridge by a black line. That was for me a little bit strange because I think that, that a valley could be more darker in general than, uh, than, uh, than a ridge. Perhaps I try to, to invert the image which I have taken from the PDF, and at least on this smile, I think it's more describing the smile as, as their original approach. So it, maybe you might uh, subscribe to this or not, but uh, uh, it shows that people were not thinking too deeply about how they adapt the, their rendering techniques, how they match uh, the actual illustrator's intention. Uh, still, the, these works were very important and great because these works we could have then built up later on to, to uh, uh, broaden our knowledge on how illustrators, how illustrators' work matches the, the perception. Another work which I uh, took as an example is a uh, work from Hertzman and Zorin in 2000 where they added to, to, to some contour lines and silhouettes some uh, shading through hatching, which is hatching and cross-hatching are standard techniques used in all the illustrations when the pen and ink was uh, kind of enforced uh, to be used in order to be able to uh, replicate these illustrations. And we can see some uh, first computational approach to generate this uh, hatching technique. Uh, Herzmann and Zorin also heard from, from perceptual scientists that this uh, that uh, the curvature descriptors, principal curvature directions, are good for conveying shape. Victoria Interante uh, claimed that as well, and they have some studies about that which supported it. So they thought it's a good idea to use the hatching where one direction in the hatch, cross hatching is uh, following the pr maximal principal direction, uh, curvature direction, and the other one follows the minimal uh, principal curvature direction. What they didn't completely uh, follow from the illustrator's perspective is that these lines, illustrators are call calling them compound lines, where one line doesn't have a meaning as such, but a set of lines together make a, make a meaning. If you look at these lines, we can see them in, as individual elements, <coughs> and that's what, what, is, what is the first... Uh, 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 failure of these techniques because we should not be able to see individual lines perceive them but we should see, uh, actually perceive the the shading so that's first problem that the spacing is is done wrongly and uh, if here will be bill andrews standing instead of me he will probably who is an illustrate medical illustrator from uh, uh, medical college of georgia he will claim that this actually not only uh, creates you this feeling of, uh, of individual lines, but it actually communicates a different material. It looks like these statues are made out of gaze. Uh, this mat uh, this uh, medical fabric, uh, which is used for, for, uh, uh, for, for, for bounds and so on. So, um, 
first good approach, but uh, not completely thought through, not completely matched. But of course, uh, the science is a, is a gradual development, so we should appreciate these techniques anyways. From the shading uh, as an example of mimicking, I think a good example could be lead sphere style transfer. Actually, the style which the artist develops is not considered at all. It's only looked up uh, how would an illustrator draw a sphere. There I have all the um, necessary normals uh, on the sphere, <coughs> which I can then, through the normals, <coughs> or I-space normals, I can transfer this style from one geometry to an arbitrary geometry. So you are having a lookup table and you are matching the normal which is on your geometry with the, uh, and looking up this, this normal where it is within the sphere and taking this color value as a style. You are taking this for granted that the style of the illustrator is good and then you are just uh, transferring it to another geometry. And indeed you can create uh, impressive renderings uh, using this style transfer, uh, but it's not about uh, deep thoughts of how illustrators have uh, come up with this uh, rendering style at the first place. <clears throat> this, was, this looks or gives a negative impression which I don't want to communicate. Uh, all these works have done a great job, but uh, but uh, this was the area of, uh, of illustrative visualization where people started to realize, okay, we have certain problems we have to fix first before we can use them. And as it was not used, maybe at that period, very, uh, very strongly, the visibility went down. Not maybe the, the intensity of works which has been put inside, but here we have visibility on as the y-axis. And then it's important to not to have a look only at the low-level visual abstractions, which are these uh, line drawings and, uh, and shadings, but at the high-level visual abstractions as well. Well, we contribute to, to the naive approach of, uh, of uh, mimicking some uh, high-level visual abstractions, such as cutaways in this case. We have created some cutaways which were basically uh, using the object which is of interest in order to create some conical clipping geometry, which will then uh, uh, allow to see inside the structures in, and, not, and those structures which are outside are effectively removed in order to, uh, in a view-dependent manner. <clears throat> well, we also realized that there are not only cutaways what illustrators are using, but also exploded views. So let's come up with a nice algorithm which can do exploded views. My colleague uh, uh, Stefan Bruckner came up with some force direct directed layout where forces are distributed to various uh, uh, elements in the, in the graphics scene, and then the physics engine is responsible for making the effective illustration. So you are, in implicit way, trying to make an, an uh, effective illustration, and for example, from this viewing angle, you don't see the object of interest, which is the, the, the brain, and then you are making it view-dependent, and you will suddenly lose one of the parts. Because physics is working like that, and you are not having your exploded view illustration under full explicit control. We also tried to make some algorithms for automated visual guidance uh, in uh, volumetric data. In case you have uh, your data already pre-segmented, you pretty much know what is inside. You would like to allow somebody else to have a, a guided tour over these features. And what we have done was in order, instead of uh, an exploration uh, scenario, uh, we just wanted the user that he selects a feature of interest and then he gets a pleasant view and full understanding where this feature is and how it looks like. So just simple scroll uh, uh, widget and we have the final rendering which shows certain bone which has been selected. But this should be interactive, so the guided tour should uh, smoothly change the viewpoint of uh, of, uh, from one point to another in order to show the, the, the feature from the best viewpoint possible. We also want to incorporate some cutaway views because we developed them uh, some, some years back and also it allows us to, to see the structures inside. 
and we also want to discriminate one structure from its context in order to clearly demonstrate which structure we actually need. And by this, we computationally came up with uh, some approach for visual guidance. Well, maybe, maybe the structures can be somehow communicated, but the, but the illustrator's thought process was not really uh, heavily considered in the development. At this point, I have to double a little bit this, uh, this curve because I would like to differentiate between uh, low-level and high-level visual abstractions a little bit more, although that's a, that's a good point for discussion to say what is a high-level and what is a low-level visual abstraction. This border is, of course, not very crisp. And we, with our techniques, we were slowly approaching the, the throat of this illusion man because we were mimicking the style of one illustrator made our thoughts and rather thought algorithmically than uh, conceptually about what the illustrator had in mind. It's also useful to think of what is the plateau of productivity? What, to, what is the final goal where we want to uh, get with our technology? <coughs> what should it be used for? So, I mean, for low-level visual abstractions, as they address more perceptual aspects, it's more about low-level understanding of the, of the scene, which is shape perception, depth perception, low-level visual attention, meaning you have certain salient features in the scene and you are, uh, you are triggered to look at these features first. These are, uh, these are the upper parts of the curve, which, uh, which could be considered as a holy grail or technology we want to uh, deliver at some point in time. For the, what, is, what the high-level visual abstraction can be used for? It uh, communicates more, it's, it's more tailored for uh, to work with, with uh, human cognition. It has a strong aspect of the domain in which it is actually applied. Uh, we can use it for selective visualization in certain medical scenario diagnosis. We are interested in certain features and we are not interested in the other features. So by means of uh, illustrators, we can, we can uh, very naturally for the human uh, define what is important to look at and what is not important. We can do quite good occlusion management, not only having semi-transparency as our technology where we can see inside, but we can have these cutaways. But how to create these cutaways really as illustrators would do it, that's another thing. Uh, and with, with our technology, we are by far not there yet. Then we can, as a holy grail, see communicating a process, how things work. Uh, with with uh, guided uh, uh, features in the image, like arrows and so on, some connecting lines, you can nicely communicate some action. Uh, there has been some uh, starting works on, on uh, communicating the process, but I think there we are really at the beginning. We can also have full, under full control in the Holy Grail uh, visual guidance over the scene. As opposed to the visual attention, this address is only the, the low level uh, features, but uh, it has been shown that you can compute the saliency of an image, but once you have a face there and it's not the salient feature by the, by the algorithm, people will, no matter whether it's salient or not, look first at the face of a, of a person. So we in, in the visual guidance, we should have all this, uh, all this uh, uh, human behavior uh, taken into account. We can have, we can have a, a nice form using high-level abstractions to communicate semantics. Illustrators have developed these uh, schemes. Arteries are red, veins are blue, bones is uh, ivory. And you don't really need to see a full detail, but just by a certain certain style you understand which feature is actually shown in the, at this particular illustration. And they are following these uh, this, uh, rules. Every illustrator has its own style, but certain standards are kept. Nerves are always yellow, for example. So this could be seen as the technology we would like to deliver at the end and have full control over it. <clears throat> um, so the era of mimicking has been the, the trigger of this technology, but at this point, just thinking of, about illustrators, I believe, is not enough. 
to make the top level publication in uh, ACM transactions on graphics or IEEE transactions on uh, visualization and computer graphics. We need to think more before we develop certain algorithm which matches certain illustrator style. So people started to, to analyze the, the visual uh, predecessor of illustrative visualization more deeply. They were looking at several illustrations and trying to uh, find out a common pattern for a certain domain why uh, and trying to find out how these illustrators were actually so effective in communicating certain features. And I would call this second step of, uh, of illustrative visualization analysis. Not only blindly mimicking certain uh, technique, but uh, before coming up with some algorithm, thinking deeply about the design of the visualization. I was very happy that I came up uh, to uh, some uh, article written by Manish Argavala and his colleagues, where he actually describes his process, uh, how he addresses research, and this was going perfectly along the lines which, uh, which uh, I think can be uh, classified as, as analysis prior to certain algorithm. It's a long text here, I just picked up some, some interesting words. So, uh, analyzing hand-designed visualizations and examining prior research on perception and cognition and when necessary, if it's not enough, conducting user studies you know, before making some formalization and once we are, our design is fixed and we have it confirmed, then we do the uh, algorithmic formalization. I think <clears throat> some work which from the low level visual abstractions can be considered in this category. One representative is suggestive contours, a technique which is always seen as in a comparison of line drawing techniques because it was a certain breakthrough. People realized that uh, illustrators <coughs> are not only drawing the silhouettes or the occluding contours, which uh, have this property of, uh, of uh, Nine, the, having, nine, having normals 90 degrees uh, to the viewing angle, but also something which could be called nearby contours. So if you will slightly modify the position of your, of your viewpoint, these lines, which are from the central viewpoint, not contours, will become suddenly contours. We can see it here and uh, at the abstraction of, uh, of the uh, David state. So in this drawing, we can see that while from this viewpoint, <coughs> just the point Q will become a contour, from its neighboring viewpoint, also the point P will become, uh, will contribute to the contour, and therefore, as a nearby viewpoint, it will, uh, it, it's, it's also called the it's suggestive contour. So that's maybe one example. Another example is uh, our apparent reaches. Uh, which were developed in 2007, <coughs> where <coughs> uh, people from MIT came up with uh, uh, an argument that region and valley lines are really good for describing a shape. But at the same time, if region and valley lines are viewpoint independent features, so if you have an object and you rotate the, your, uh, your object, which is depicted by region and valley lines, these lines stay exactly on the same spatial position where they were. They, they are not view dependent. And this gives in an animation an impression that it is more a texture than, uh, than uh, some, uh, some uh, line abstraction. So it kind of sticks to the, to, the, to the object which is being drawn and it doesn't communicate this, uh, this, uh, this, this drawing aspect of, uh, of certain geometry. So they said, Reach lines are, are very important, but we need to modify them to be viewpoint, in, viewpoint dependent in order to uh, not to be considered as some kind of texture on the object. The principle can be seen here. They are using view dependent curvature as a measure, and the lots of uh, maximal view dependent curvature are then. Uh, the, the apparent reach generator. It, in many cases, spatially coincides with the reach. It's close enough, but it's not exactly at the same position. And it's changing 
based on the viewpoint changes. In these areas also, the, uh, these apparent ridges under some uh, ambient uh, illumination, uh, they coincide with uh, Kani edge detector lines, which would be just uh, extracted from an image. Imagine you have a final rendering of, uh, of a shaded scene, and then you are uh, processing this, uh, this image uh, with Kani edge detector. Those lines which will be depicted there will quite coincide with the apparent ridge. That will be an important uh, uh, aspect later on the slides. So I think in the low-level visual abstractions, the, the, the work of the Carlo and uh, Tilke Jude and their colleagues started to analyze a uh, more what is behind the drawing <coughs> of the lines by illustrators. When we look again at the high-level visual abstractions, people already a long time ago, Deep Stratton and colleagues, have uh, came up with some rules how to create a cutaway and section views. And these rules uh, were observed from illustrations, although they were not very uh, clear about how many illustrations did they uh, did they, op did they uh, base their analysis on, uh, they clearly made their thoughts before making certain algorithm. So what they were saying that inside and outside objects should be differentiable, you should be clear about what is inside and what is the, uh, what is the focus and what is the context. Section view should be intersection of two half spaces, as we can see here, so we create a cutaway, or section, section cut, which is dependent on the occluder, not on the focus. This is the first mentioning that actually the geometry should be dependent on the occluder's geometry, not on the focus geometry. Section should be aligned to the main axis of the outside object. Yes, this is what I, what I meant. Uh, jittery mechanism for cutouts, so it's good to make some kind of a breaking in uh, uh, impression in order to communicate that there is an outer layer which has been broken uh, in order to see inside. Cutout walls should be visible. Uh, by that, they mean probably some, some difference like this. While this is a volumetric data set of some, uh, some synthetic data, this data set, uh, we have used the original gradients here first. And as the gradients in the homogeneous medium are zero, there is no shading at all. There are normals of, uh, of size uh, magnitude zero. Uh, well, therefore, we need to modify this, these normals on the cut in order to bring the cut walls visible. Yeah, that's what they meant. Cutout is a single hole. We have, in many cases, not one object which is of interest, but several objects scattered around. It's better to make uh, one bigger cut than uh, several thousands of small uh, cut ends. And interior object should be visible from any viewing angle. So this communicates that it is a view-dependent technique. And this has been uh, uh, very successfully adopted by Wilmot Lee et al., uh, in 2007, where they said previous work on cutaways took into account the focus for generating this cut, this cut geometry, what we want to do, we want to communicate those shapes where we actually remove information from, which are the occluders. So if this occluder is of a, a cylindrical shape, we should cut it in such a way that the viewer can automatically close this uh, missing part as being as mentally as if it was there in the image. So we can see this, uh, this wedge cuts on some uh, exploiting symmetries and so on. What we also see is that uh, the cuts should reveal the, should be oriented in such a way that they reveal the thickness of the structures we are cutting through, and so on. So, a uh, longer analysis before coming up with some solution. I'm here listing also some our work where <coughs> we try to use cutaways, which is quite a popular technique in, uh, in geological illustrations in the domain of geology. And we used the naive approach developed by us and then adopted by uh, Michael Burns and his colleagues for polygons. And we realized that these cutaways do not bring us too much. And we have realized that, that the, the, 
the brittleness of uh, of objects in the geology makes it very often the illustrators co to communicate these uh, these hard structures by hard cuts, not smooth cuts as if in medical illustration, for example. But uh, often these cuts are hard, and often they are having relatively simple geometry because the objects which are communicated then inside are of are of a shape which you uh, do not have prior knowledge about. In geology, a channel as a feature can be arbitrarily shaped. In medical illustration, you have kidney, which looks almost always as a kidney. Uh, so there you have some expectations how these objects look. In geology, you often do not have this uh, understanding. So it's good to have simple cuts. It's good to have oblique cuts. Similarly, if you have uh, some lighting design, it's good not to have the <coughs> headlamp set up from the front because this is like making a flash image, but have the, have the light slightly from uh, direction above. The, the same holds for creating a cut. You see more perspective and depth when the cut is not uh, completely aligned with your viewing direction, as it is in the in, in the first uh, as it was in the first technique. And the cut should be, if possible, aligned with the context, because there you can communicate certain structures more. Like for example, here one horizon is. That's where the channels are actually located in this uh, in this. Uh, geological structure here. So why not communicating its surface? Because we know that it is with it in, so its lower border will not occlude the, our structures of interest. So we do not need to always uh, come back to the most simple shape, but also uh, uh, we can use some contextual information to, to enrich the visualization. So when it comes to exploded views, Wilmot Lee and colleagues uh, came up with more sophisticated method to uh, to uh, use exploded views for communicating which structures are inside and outside. What they have done, they made first an analysis of, okay, I need to know before I explode structures, they should not penetrate each other. So first, those structures should be exploded, which are on the most outside, and those which are most inside should follow them, them afterwards. And if possible, we can cluster certain structures in some semantic units which are then exploded together uh, to understand that this is one functional unit. Also, the, the level of explosion is not triggered by any <coughs> physics engine, but by direct uh, measurement, how much of explosion do I need to be able to see the structures of interest, and I'm exploding in certain direction only by this amount and not more, because then I can, uh, I'm uh, losing efficiency, image efficiency, uh, um, need a bigger image for communicating that illustration. Um, this is a short note that, although I'm talking primarily about illustrative visualization, you can see there's a general, uh, general methodology. Studying the prior art in order to develop new visualization techniques. This is what uh, Mani Jargavala have done uh, in his work. This is just one example from his uh, recent article, which I was already once referring to. A simple rules how to create a metro plan, subway plan, out of uh, a standard uh, topographic map. <coughs> well, if you are inside a tube, you are not so much interested how the uh, trajectory looks like, you would like to have an approximate understanding of it. But first of all, you need to know how should you get from one point to another point, and you need to know clearly where you should change your subway and so on. So this uh, is, we, you should first easify the reading of the stops, making the, the notes uh, of uh, changing subways very clear and so on. You have to straight, so therefore you rather straight the subway lines, straighten the subway lines and space the the subway stations evenly in order to uh, have them easily readable and sacrifice this, uh, the, the, the geographic exactness. I think this analysis part to which uh, uh, these authors contributed to is actually already getting us out of this throat of disillusionment because they analyzed thoroughly uh, before they came up with uh, some technique some algorithm. 
But <clears throat> so they partially were able to answer the question, how are illustrators doing uh, performing certain technique? But they didn't communicate why they, they did it this way, really. And whether this was the best choice which is possible from the all uh, possibilities uh, one could imagine. Therefore, I think the third part of, uh, of uh, the, the, the cycle, life cycle of illustrative visualization is validation, which might bring us towards the plateau of productivity. So if we know why certain thing is effective, then we can effectively also use it in certain situations. So I have here a cheesy pictogram which, uh, which communicates that instead of thinking over some illustrators who, illustrator who is in the distance and reading some books of uh, vision science, we better communicate more with uh, illustrators and perception scientists more closely to come up with uh, effective visual designs. And I like this uh, work which I'm going to describe now very much because this goes exactly along these lines. Uh, for uh, Cole and his colleagues from uh, MIT lab, I, I believe again, uh, they, have, uh, ca they came up with certain shapes, some categories, some mechanical parts, some, some organic parts, some soft objects, and some synthetic objects. Uh, they rendered them with the state-of-the-art rendering technique, and then they asked the illustrators to draw these objects based on the image they provided. And this, you can see the process. The illustrator had one big image, which he should uh, basically make an uh, abstraction, line abstraction of. And then he was provided with other viewpoints in order to have clear understanding how this object looks like. After this line drawing has been done, and they claim that many uh, artists actually want to use also compound lines, but the subject of the study were clearly only the line drawings without any hatching and shading techniques. So they forbid them to do it. Then they came with a problem, how can we now compare these techniques without, uh, because the artist doesn't have a mathematical precision where he's putting the line. He's, he's expressing qualitatively what is the, what is the, what is the shape about. So they made kind of a registration approach where they had a semi-transparent uh, uh, paper on, on this part. Here was their previous illustration, and the illustrator had to manually draw the same lines he drew on this unregistered uh, drawing, draw them over uh, on this, uh, this semi-transparent paper, so he clearly was able to put them where he wanted to put them, uh, in the same geometric location. So they had some illustrator lines, like for example, you can see here, uh, there were about 20 skilled illustrators of various uh, levels of training uh, drawing these, uh, these uh, geometries. And you can see that at some places the, the, the lines coincide very well, and on some other places these lines are a little bit uh, more distributed. And then they came up with an idea to, uh, to generate the synthetic uh, or computer-based uh, illustrations and match, for example, suggestive contours or apparent ridges. How do they coincide with, uh, with the line drawings of, uh, of, of a human, of a skilled human? Well, they found out that it, that it actually changes from the type of, uh, of object which is drawn. So, for example, for some parts, like... Uh, this uh, synthetic part, the, the apparent ridges and ridges, ridge and valley lines were very much used by the illustrators. So they coin there was a strong coincidence between the synthetic technique of uh, ridge and valley lines and ridges and valleys and apparent ridges uh, for the mechanical parts and for the synth synthetic parts. For the clothes, there, was, uh, there were lines, some lines were more corresponding to suggestive contours, some other lines were more corresponding to apparent ridges. And on these illustrations, you can see the difference how people draw. So it is not really possible to come up with one approach uh, of line drawing, because everybody has a different uh, attitude to, to depict which lines are important. 
But what is also possible to do is to classify an artist based on the, the computational techniques. How much is he using suggestive contours? How much is he using other techniques? And you can see the difference between these two artists. You can formalize their approach, their, their rendering style, by means of similarity to computational uh, line drawing generators. <coughs> so this study was, uh, uh, was also, I'm here listing the, the object uh, space uh, line generators, but you have also, for example, Kenny, Edge detector, which just takes the image intensities and traces the ridges on this uh, on this uh, uh, intensity uh, maps, <coughs> uh, and they found out that actually the best match between an illustrator's uh, gener generated image and uh, a computational method is a Kani edge detector. So, after all this effort. Uh, done by finding out the best object uh, space uh, lines, a Kani edge detector has the best match, which is very old and very simple technique as compared to the other techniques. But it has, there is a reason for that. That's how uh, our perceptual system works like. The Kani edge detector is probably a good approximation of that. And then there is no big surprise that those lines which the perception is extracting are then put back on the final drawing. <coughs> Well, they argue that I'm talking mostly about, of, of, about these numbers here. Uh, I don't want you to, to read through all these numbers which are not uh, understandable at this time uh, anyways. But, but uh, what they came up with is with an argument that a reasonable combination of object space, uh, object space lines could, be, uh, could match uh, the illustrator's drawing better than simple Kani edge detector. So, there is still good reasoning for having these object space line generators. A consecutive work of uh, uh, Forrester Cole and, Cole and colleagues was now we know which lines, how do they correspond to the hand draw lines to our computer generated techniques, but do we really know that they, that they are effective? Do we know that the illustrator's way of conveying shape is effective? Well, uh, do we know that our techniques are effective? No. So let's, let's make a study <coughs> about this. They used the previous results from the previous work uh, the, of this, the data set of co-registered line drawings, also with the, the computational line drawing generators. And they were using this uh, standard shape uh, perce perception task of uh, setting up a gauge, which uh, on some in some area, so these are all small gauges which, uh, which consist of one uh, line which should, be, which should copy the normal and uh, some kind of a disk which should uh, follow the, the, the shape at this small area. And they asked through Amazon Turk technology, I think 275,000 samples uh, of, uh, of setting up a gauge. So there was a very good exploitation of, uh, of how you can uh, use current technology <coughs> of outsourcing uh, work power and they, their, their claim was in case the light position is, is placed correctly the best way of communicating shape is a full shaded image uh, as compared to some line drawing abstractions simply because you have more information there about the, uh, through the shading and they were right uh, they made a study about how much the, the perceived normal coincides with the normal of the geometry. They found out that the error distribution here is uh, as follows. The more you have, basically, you have to interpret this, this graph as the higher is the peak closer to zero, the, more, the better, uh, the lower error in, uh, in assessment. So if the error is... Uh, this is a histogram of, of, uh, of errors. If people were on average wrong one degree uh, with setting up a normal, then the, this, uh, this peak here will be high. And their hypothesis that the shaded image is the best in perceiving shape is, was confirmed here. There is a, a high bump of, uh, of errors and close to the zero angle. And 
the contours, which is this example, which consists of least information, has a lowest bump in this area, is much more uniformly distributed than the other lines. What they also find, found out that uh, here is a categorization uh, and here is some, some average, uh, some mean error over all these illustrations. They found out that uh, shaded image has the least mean error. There is a human uh, il illustration compared to the synthetic uh, uh, line generators. They found out that some perform actually better than uh, the human drawing. So if, we, if our intent is to, is to communicate shape, we have reached the level of, uh, of human communication of the shape uh, with our computational techniques. Basically, this is what these numbers say. say. We, are, we have not reached the aesthetic level, uh, the, the pleasingness of these lines, perhaps, but we have, but other, when we look at this as a goal to communicate shape, we have reached this level, which is a great achievement, in my opinion. If you have another question about uh, why illustrators put the lights usually to the top left corner when they draw illustrations. Another uh, study has been conducted to where people were modifying the position of light uh, in the azimuth direction, where, so, like, like this, and not, not in, the, in the other spherical direction, and they found out uh, they again had this study of, uh, of uh, placing um, uh, these, uh, these gauges. They found out that the best precision of placing a gauge is, uh, is when the angle is between 20 to 40 degrees above uh, the, the, the zero angle. So having a light from above 20 to 40 degrees is the best for our shape perception. And that's why illustrators are placing this, uh, this light source above. We have made some study about why illustrators do use these blue shadows instead of just the luminance darkening, which would be more corresponding to what is happening in nature. And as you can see, not only illustrators, but all visual artists. So what, what we try to do is, you have some contribution of darkening for shading and for shadowing. And we can <coughs> decompose these two. And for shadowing, what we did, we the the level how much it, the certain point in space we shadowed, we, we use the same contrast in uh, uh, some perceptual color uh, space, but we shifted this, uh, this uh, luminance uh, shift towards more uh, luminance and chromatic shift. And we're assessing whether we can by this have uh, more information in the shaded areas where we can uh, uh, still understand shape in areas of shadow. This was a typical problem in visualization recently. Ambient occlusion is great technique, but actually you cannot see inside, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, an application here. So this is what we wanted to re reveal. You can see here that this area becomes quite dark with, with just shadowing. You can ha increase the entire lightness and by that you, you gain some information here, but you lose some information somewhere else. And by uh, the chromatic shift, you can have a crisp information in both the lighter and the darker areas. It's somehow an illustrator's approach to tone mapping. And we made a study about uh, whether uh, people can at the same time perceive depth and shape. And uh, we came up with some good indicators that uh, that uh, uh, the chromatic shadows are good means for communicate both. So for low level visual abstractions, we can see that, that uh, some works are already reaching this plateau of productivity, especially maybe this call et al with their validation should be placed more further on the curve because I think that's a very useful information. <clears throat> but many times before, uh, in, for high-level visual abstractions, we, we do not need only the perception to take into account, but the actual use of this uh, graphics representation in certain domain. Manisher Gavala has, uh, made, has made a good example how to, how to 
come up with some design principles in a way which is, uh, which is robust. So one idea is you have, yeah, yeah. You, have, uh, you, have, uh, you have a problem how to depict uh, assembling certain structures. So first, what they did was they let people to assemble certain magnificent pieces of, uh, of internal uh, design uh, to put together and to communicate uh, how uh, they did it in a visual way and on also in the written way. Then there was another user group which was assessing the quality of <coughs> these uh, uh, indicators, how this should be done. And from the best ones, there was another user group which was, to, uh, which was uh, asked to, to follow the, s these instructions, randomly chosen which one out of the best, and assess the time and uh, when, how, what was the fastest way to come up with the goal of assembling this, uh, this object. So, and by this, the people were always asked what they preferred, what they liked, and what they disliked. And based on this experience, so hands-on, they came up with some design principles, which they then, um, uh, which they then uh, uh, formalized and also validated already in the design phase. So that's one way to tackle the problem, how can I uh, validate the cognitive, uh, more cognitive aspects of, uh, of, of graphics. Um, another way is, like uh, what, have been, what has been done by people from Magdeburg, evaluating whether semi-transparency or cutaways or cutaways with de depth enhancement, which one is the best for communicating uh, some flow inside uh, an Aurisma dataset. They, Doctors obviously need both. They need to see the shape of the aneurysma and they need to understand the flow patterns inside. And they, came, they were analyzing whether sem semi-transparency is best or, or the other uh, cutaway metaphors are better uh, in a way that they broke the cognitive uh, task of diagnosis into perceptual subtasks, which could be perceptually analyzed. And these ones, uh, they analyzed perceptually and the, when the result confirmed the hypothesis, they were able to claim that the cognitive, for a certain cognitive task, this visual depiction is the best. So one way is to conduct hands-on user studies. Another way is to break it down into reasonable perceptual tasks, which are then evaluated by means of perception. I think these two works started us to get to the, to the plateau of productivity, but we are at the very beginning with the high-level visual abstractions, I believe. I was, on this talk, wanted to share my thoughts with you about the development in the area of illustrative visualization, where we saw first some mimicking of illustrators, then some more thorough analysis, and in the latest, we have seen some, some thorough validation of, uh, of the analysis which has been done before, which I think brings us somewhere where these techniques can be used effectively. <clears throat> so I think when it comes to the perceptual aspects, there are some, some uh, works from us coming which already show that uh, we are getting to the plateau of productivity towards the end. Uh, while with the cognitive aspects, I think we are at the very beginning. But uh, so therefore, it's important that we share uh, our thoughts about algorithms with the domain users, with illustrators, and with perceptual scientists together. Uh, I would like to thank these people that they helped me throughout the presentation. <laughs> and I would like to thank you for the attention. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for wonderful talk. We have a few moments for coffee. Any questions?